I, I think we're okay to start. Is that okay, Ms. Professor Pandey? Yeah, that'd be great, thanks. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. It is with great pleasure that I formally welcome you all to a conversation with Professor Rohini Pandey, moderated by Lisa Ho. Uh, for those tuning in for the first time, Women in Econ Policy is a nonprofit that aims to create an inclusive space for women interested in economics and policy to learn from each other network and collaborate. The group consists of more than 1,500 women of various experiences, ages, and backgrounds with a common interest in economics, development, and policy issues. Please visit our website for more information, that is www.womenineconpolicy.com, or for it, or any other social media pages for more information and to stay updated on the group's activities. Before I go on to introduce our speakers, I'd like to reiterate some housekeeping news. Um, first is, of course, as you might have been notified, this session, this session is being recorded. And so for the duration of the session, I'd request everyone to keep their mics on mute. And uh, towards the end of the session, if time permits, we will be taking on the spot questions. But And for that, I would encourage all of you to use the chat box feature. We will be monitoring that very closely. So please do not unmute uh, for the same. Um, I'm very excited to announce the speaker and moderator for today. Uh, Dr. Rohini Pandey is currently the Henry J. Hines II Professor of Economics and the Director of Economic Growth Center, Yale University. She's also the co-editor of the Economic, American Economic Review Insights. She has been regarded as one of the most, most influential development economists of her generation, according to the American Economic Review and has made notable contributions to political economy, international development, gender economics, anti-corruption, and efforts to combat climate change. In 2018, she received the Caroline Bell Shaw Award for the American Economic Association for promoting the success of women in, in economics profession. She is the co-chair of the political economy and government group at Jamil Poverty Action Lab, JPAL, a board member of the Bureau of Research on Economic Development, BRED, and a former co-editor of the Review of Economics and Statistics. Before joining Yale, she was the Rafiq Hariri Professor of International Political Economy at Howard Kennedy School, where she co-founded Evidence for Policy Design, EPOD, which works with developing economy governments to address policy problems. She received a PhD in economics from London School of Economics, a master's in policy, politics, and economics from Oxford University, which she attended as a Rhodes Scholar. Lisa Ho is a fourth year PhD student in economics at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In her research, she plans to study the introduction and growth of internet access in low and middle income countries, particularly its effects on education and women's work. Lisa has an undergraduate degree from MIT where she majored in computer science and mathematical economics. Lisa is a Schwarzman scholar and has pursued a year of studies and leadership training at Singhua University in Beijing. Thank you both for taking other time to participate in what I know is going to be an extremely engaging session. So without further delays, over to you, Lisa. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Ayushi, and for inviting me to be here. I'm honored to moderate this discussion with such an inspiring economist, Professor Rohini Pandey. So to kick this off, we were going to begin with your journey so far in the economics profession. Um, so, Professor Pandey, what first motivated you to study economics? Thanks, and let me start by thanking um, the Women's and Economic Policy Group for inviting me and Lisa for taking time early in the morning for this session. So, I, you know, it's my story of getting to, into economics is actually a story of uh, realizing that I really should not be a medical doctor. So, like, Many people, many kids in India sort of studied for, um, you know, uh, medical entrance exams after school. And then I landed up in, um, in, a, in a medical college in Delhi. And I think I have very rarely with such clarity realized that this, is, that this was something I was not suited for. And I think within three days, I realized that, you know, it would be extremely bad for the world if I became a medical doctor. The problem was that at this point, I'd only done sciences in uh, school. And I think part of realizing that I really should not be a doctor was also thinking that I really don't, I want to run away from the sciences, but I'd only done the sciences. So it wasn't very easy to um, you know, get into 
something like very far away from it from uh, the sciences. So economics was actually the only uh, subject that I could get into without getting to the sciences in Delhi University. So that's a long or short of how I got in, which is, I guess, uh, not very um, positive. I think the more positive part is that I went through my undergraduate degree in Delhi, still thinking that um, I was meant to do something um, in the humanities. And so I then when I went to Oxford, actually decided to do uh, philosophy, politics, and economics, and primarily do philosophy and politics um, as a way of moving away from economics. And then I realized that philosophy is actually kind of, especially analytical philosophy, is kind of way harder in a lot of ways than just uh, doing economics. And so I came back and I came back to economics and did a master's at LSE. And I think that's probably the year in which I really decided that I enjoyed economics and the questions I could ask through economics. But it Certainly, it took me, I'd say, you know, a good five years of undergraduate education to get to that point. Most, most of which I was using economics as a way of running away from other subjects. And what was it about the degree at LSC that kind of finally made you think, okay, economics, this is what I want to run with? So I think it was, um, it, it was training. It was, it was a very um, you know, the, the master's programs at LSE can be very large. These were large classrooms. You were just doing problem sets in micro, macro, econometrics week after week. But I think they were just very well structured. So you could sort of see progression as you went through problem sets of what you were learning. So I think it was more, uh, and maybe that was something that had appealed to me earlier on when I'd done science in school and afterwards was just something that was logical and had structure to it as a way of, answering questions. Um, I think I actually did my field in my, in my master's in international trade, not in development. Um, but you know, this was this was uh, 95, India was going through a large period of liberalization of 92. So it was actually an interesting way to think about things like gains from trade um, in, in, in the coursework and thinking about it where suddenly back in India now all these goods were available um, that were not available at all just three years ago. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you've worked on research kind of which studies a wide range of topics. And I guess you started off thinking about international trade. Um, when you were just first starting out, how did you decide what to study and how did your research interests evolve into what they are today? So, you know, when people ask me like how what I studied and you know how my interests evolved, I always say that there's um, I think only one piece of advice I would give people from what I learned in my graduate school, which is like, don't work on something that you're not interested in, because it's just really boring to spend a lot of time. So actually, as I said, I did my I did my master's in trade. And so when I started doing my my PhD work, I was working a lot with at that time, sort of spatial economics had just come to trade. So I was working a lot with these sort of kind of trade uh, models, the CES production functions. And I started looking, at, and I was doing theory at that time, so I was looking at um, interlinkages between agriculture and industry during process of st structural transformation. But, you know, it was, it was a lot of, um, I'd say, the paper was a lot of solving algebra, it wasn't particularly deep on any side, and I was, you know, I think I was, I was quite, <laughs> good at sitting down at a desk and working nine to five. Um, and I probably, um, I mean, that's something I think that studying in Indian schools and in colleges do does for you. But I think I never felt like this is something I would want to do for the rest of my life. I, I didn't think I would drop out of a PhD. I thought, I thought I'd finish it, but this, this it just like was not very interesting. And then I think this one day I was reading the news and I read about um, these political reservations that had come in for women and that just seemed kind of interesting. Um, and I, I remember I'd gone to grab a coffee and I was just talking to my advisor and he said, oh, that seems interesting as well. And so then I went back and looked and saw that actually reservation for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes had existed for a long time. And, and I think that was really when I got interested in something to work on. The only problem was that I had done no econometrics. So I had trained as a, in theory and trade, and you know my first papers had been on that. So it was, it was um, not easy <laughs> figuring out how to actually do it, and then also getting the data was a bit of pain because um, the 
government libraries at that time, you couldn't um, photocopy, you couldn't take in computers. It was literally you would write down tables by hand and then come out and then type them in and hope that you hadn't go got the data wrong. Um, so, but I think it was, it was, I'd say perhaps not the most thoughtful process. I, I mean, I think, um, you know, you often look back and reimagine yourself and what you did. I think I find, even when I look back, I think it was more like deciding to do something and then kind of going down that route, not necessarily thinking where it would lead, but maybe just getting a bit lucky along the way and it actually working out. And I think along that, I think doing that three or four times is when I started realizing, okay, this is what I enjoy. And then I became more thoughtful, but I certainly didn't start by being very thoughtful about what I was interested in. Were there ever any projects that you had difficult that maybe you found interesting, but had difficulty gaining interest in from other people in the field? And if so, how did you advocate for projects or research areas that you were interested in? I think what I was very lucky about was I think the first couple of jobs I had after I finished my PhD were in places where it was reasonably explicit that there was that no matter what you did, tenure was not on the table. Um, and I think that was very, um, it's certainly not something I would advocate as a system, but it was very liberating when it came to doing research. Because, you know, it was like, you know, it's not like anything I'm going to do is going to make a difference to uh, what's going to happen to my future here, so I might as well have fun. So I think, I think that was that was nice, because I think that really, I did some work on the kind of gender gap in voting in the US. And I think it's quite unusual for someone doing development to just look at the same question in a very different country. And I think if I had been in a place where I thought, oh, I have to define myself as a development economist, I have to have this very structured agenda, I wouldn't have probably done that. Um, that sounds interesting. I hadn't realized that that was kind of the setup when you were going in. So how did you decide to take those positions anyway? And would you kind of recommend doing that or what mindset would you recommend? So but, so I think, so a lot of it has changed. So like, for instance, when I was at Yale as a junior faculty, they officially didn't have tenure. So the idea was that when a junior faculty member came up, the department could decide to do an open search in the field, but you would be one competitor along with others. And, you know, I think when that happened for me, the person I was kind of up against was 25 years older than me. So, you know, it was, so I think that was just how it was. I I do think, you know, institutions always survive without individuals uh, and do very well. Um, but somehow they're forced, especially when you're young or new and kind of your creativity can be a little bit paralyzing, can be a little bit believing that conforming will be valuable. Um, I think conforming can be very valuable. But I don't, I don't think institutions are ones that sort of notice and respond. I think people do. So I think, I think, I think when you choose, when anyone chooses a department, I think they should do it for whether they like the people there and they like the atmosphere there, but whether the rule on the book says that there is tenure or what are the conditions under tenure, I don't think that's something that um, people will stick by the rules or they'll bend it if they like someone. So I, I always think should think about the people and you know I was all the places I was in I think that's probably why I went to them was my first job was in Colombia and I joined with uh, six other assistant professors I think it's very rare you have seven junior faculty starting in a year um, and that was great I mean it was just a really nice set of people but you know at the end we all also came in sort of thinking you know we have six years to enjoy New York and then we're out of here um, and so, so I think I think I think the people in all these places made a big difference, but certainly not the institutions. Okay, interesting. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so I guess in your career so far, have there been any unexpected turns or transitions, and what helped you to better prepare for them? I think. Um, I mean, again, as I said, I think it's always hard because you can kind of look back and reinterpret things very differently from how you felt them in the moment. So, you know, in the moment, maybe when you switch to job, you're really upset and now you're like, oh, that was such a great thing that happened at that uh, point. I think maybe the one unexpected turn, which I was happy 
um, to have done afterwards was to move from an economics department um, to a policy school. Um, I think that was something that was an active choice. I mean, I had the choice to stay on in a set of economics departments. And I think, I, I mean, I stayed in Kennedy School for 12 years and I I think I really benefited from being in a place that had a broad um, array of uh, disciplinary approaches and you know the economists were maybe fewer in number but that was something that maybe I hadn't, I hadn't thought through what it meant when I went I mean I very much went to Kennedy School saying oh that's just another econ group there it's not going to be so different but I think it was different it was different not just in the students but I think it was different in people's perspective and how broadly they thought and I think that was really valuable to have that just after I'd gotten tenure because I think you know on tenure track no matter what you say and no matter what I just said the last few years you're very focused on what is it going to do to take to get tenure and I think once you get tenure you need something to move you out and say you know do things that you want to do not just by the system and I think that move was one that helped me do that. And I guess for people in the audience who are considering pursuing graduate degrees at public policy schools or econ departments, would you have any advice on how to kind of choose between the two of them, given your experience in each? So I actually think for a student going into a policy school, it's not going to feel that different. I, I think, um, you know, policy schools in the end, the number are growing, but they're not a huge number of schools yet. And I don't know of any policy school who says we want to hire a PhD in public policy. I think they'll typically say, you know, they may they'd be happy to hire someone PhD in public policy, but they'd be equally ha happy to hire someone who has a PhD in economics with policy interests. So I actually think, you know, there are some very well ranked, extremely good uh, policy PhD programs. And I think you should apply to them as much as you apply to comparable economics departments. But I don't think one should go into a policy PhD because you think you don't want to do an economics degree, but are interested in academia. Of course, if you're not interested in academia, you want to do something else in policy, then I would say be careful about which policy PhD program you choose because some policy PhD programs are just kind of, at least the econ side of it is just an econ PhD track. It's really not different. Um, the others are, I think there are others that are much broader. And so, so I think there's certainly a choice of if you're sure you don't want to do a PhD for academia and you want to do it for policy, then you may want to think about which type of policy school you want to do. But if you are on an econ, if you think you want to be in academia, then I think, you know, you should just apply to a bunch of schools and choose the one that, that uh, fits you best, but not particularly focus on policy schools thinking that they look different. Okay, great. Thank you so much for kind of telling us about the policy school econ department um, differences. So I guess transitioning a little bit to more about your research and about your policy work in the field. Um, one question that people were very interested in hearing about is how well matched do you think economists research priorities are with policymakers priorities in India, and where you think the areas are of greatest mismatch. So I think, especially right now in India, it's important to think of who uh, one's counterpart is, um, right? So I think your counterpart could be an NGO or an activist group, which is going to be very different from your counterpart being the government. So, you know, especially I think right now, like coming out of COVID in India, one of the big issues everyone's concerned about is what's happening with things like education, schools reopening with uh, issues like midday meals. And then I think it's, it's interesting, the perspective you get is very different if you talk to, say, right to food activists uh, and, you know, how they are very concerned about how midday meals are not coming back to schools or, or in general that, you know, the basic infrastructure of education may come on, but a lot of, um, I think, the extra pushes that you'd seen in these sectors over the last 15 years may or may not come back as fast. And I think that's an important perspective and, you know, as researchers, we may want to be responsive to thinking about how do you increase government accountability to its citizens. And in that case, you may actually have your perspective may really not be aligned with the governments. Uh, so I, th so I, think, I think, I do think sometimes we have, you know, increasingly 
conversation that we need to um, sorry uh, you increasingly need to you know be engaged with the government or you need to scale up through the governments i think just given the nature of governments in many settings right now i think it's an open question of even if we want to have domestic take up of policies which is the right route to think about I mean, sometimes it will be governments. In India, it may often be also state governments with different perspectives than the federal government. It may be the federal government. Um, I think the other place that I think researchers should be thinking about and we don't think enough about is, you know, not just, maybe not our engagement, but our differentiation, I'd say, from uh, consultancies. So one thing certainly in India you see increasingly is in a lot of these sort of social arms of consultancy. So you'd have Dahlberg or you'd have, you know, Pricewaterhouse. And they're very much right now, you know, willing to enter, say, the Planning Commission or other places and be part of those conversations. Uh, so what is the role of researchers in a world where it's not just, say, a bureaucrat or an elected representative, but it's actually a set of private sector players who are going to, you know, who are going to do probably a great job in implementation, but not necessarily think very hard about what that objective function is. Uh, you know, do you want to just enter that room and sort of say, you know, we want to be one more player along with them? That somehow seems, you know, you're never going to win at that game. Um, so I, th I, th I think, I think it's thinking about alignment between governments and uh, citizens or governments and researchers is important, but it's equally to ask, sort of, think about all the players in the ecosystem, which are not just the government and the, and the researcher. And so can you say a little bit more about what you would, what you think that economists as researchers, what, what we have as a comparative advantage relative to um, consultancies like Alberg or other kind of private players in the market? I think we have. I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, I think we have. I, I, I think we have some disadvantages in that we are often uh, less resourced, I think, and less able to be Im immediately responsive. So, so I'm sympathetic to why um, you know governments or policymakers may often look for these agencies who have you know people on the bench who can come and be in their office in a way that I think researchers can't be. I also think researchers often have timeline timelines that are quite long, but I think the flip side of it is that we often look at questions that the that are important for a policymaker, but they may not ask that of a consultant because the timeline is too long. So, um, so I think that's probably I'd say our main advantage is that I think we're not constrained in. Um, the questions by, you know, being like expensive. And so, you know, if, if someone's taking a Dahlberg consultant, they'll be like, okay, what can we get out of Dahlberg consultant or uh, any other one? I don't particularly want to uh, take, um, you know, any consultant over X time period. I don't think with researchers, you hear that question being asked about, you know, what, you know, that your timeline is this much and you have to move on. So I think that's probably one advantage that you can have maybe more thoughtful conversations about what it matters, but I can also see why working with researchers can often be very frustrating. And what advice would you have about getting started with collaborations with the government, I guess, for people who kind of don't already have those um, I, mean, I, said, I mean, I think it's important to think about the question you want to answer uh, or the question you want to find out about. And then I think you really want to think about your counterparts. So I guess what I, what I was trying to say is I think right now in particular, I think it's useful to think of a broad set of counterparts you might have. I think I think the governments may be one, but there may be others. So I think it's, it's really important to think about the question you want to, you're interested in. But then I think also to not have too strongly formed a question. I think one of the reasons why, uh, you know, when we started EPOD or when we started working more with governments on really um, kind of capacity training and data work was a, a realization that we were often talking to uh, policymakers too late, right? You know, I had some idea, I did an evaluation, and then I go and say, hey, look, this is an amazing result. Can we think about it? They'll be like, but this is really not something I'm interested in. I mean, it's very nice, but this is just not 
my what my day job is about and so i think in that case it then becomes important that you're able to uh talk early enough to really figure out whether there is something that's interesting to you and importantly interesting to your counterpart and i guess regardless of whether your counterpart is government or non-government partner what would you say makes for a good implementation partner and what are potential red flags to look for? I think a red flag on either side for uh, for implementation partner looking at a researcher or a researcher looking at implementation partner is a lot of certainty on what you want the answer to be. Um, so I think I think that I think so I think you know uh, evaluating a program that someone is certain is working very well and they want kind of the they want to be able to show that's working very well i think is a red flag because that may not be what you find uh in evaluation i think on the flip side um and, and again this on both i mean i think if you talk to people in areas i think they they often have both incredibly good insights about what is it isn't working but also a lot of curiosity and i think that's what you want to build on is kind of grounds of common curiosity what are you curious about what are they curious about and is that actually something that is uh, useful to explore further okay yes i guess that makes a lot of sense as a red flag um can you tell us about a collaboration either with the government partner or another partner that has been really successful in your research um, and just tell us a bit more about what you've done together. So I can tell you about, I think, an eval um, a partnership that has been su su successful in the traditional sense of it, kind of you got a good result and it got implemented. But there are also I think, partnerships that have been successful because it's they changed in a lot of ways the way I think. So, um, you know, on the, on the first, um, you know, I've been working for a long time now with um, kind of a set of environmental regulators in Gujarat with a set of colleagues. And you know, the, pro the way the project really started was I was in Kennedy School and this lady walked into my office who was the lawyer for um, the, the Pollution Control Board and they'd been taken to court by a set of firms on some audit issues. And the court had asked them to come back with some evidence on on, 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 on the case. And so she said, oh, she'd heard, she'd come to Kennedy School for an executive education program. And she'd heard that this is what fa some faculty do. And you would say, well, what a completely naive way of thinking about academia. But actually it was one of the few cases where it was actually, I just actually have literally happened to be going to Gujarat the next week um, for, for some teaching. And so I managed to meet the people and that's how, so that was completely fortuitous. And it's been, it's been like, a long and I think sort of uh, pretty successful relationship in terms of being able to work at scale with the pollution control boards and being able to uh, bring that evidence um, to bear. Um, but I, it's also kind of in some ways quite a traditional partnership, right? It's like, it's, it's a well-found question. You work, you work with your partner, you, you, you kind of find what works and you get it to scale. I'd say on the flip side, um, you know, I've been working on for, for various years with much more, I'd also say much more mixed publication success. I think almost none of those papers are published on thinking about um, how to increase transparency on elected representative performance, especially before elections. And I've been working with um, on that, or at least uh, with um, a group in India that was actually very influential in uh, passing the Right to Information Act. And I'd say, you know, there, I think the way it, it has been for me an ongoing and incredibly valuable uh, partnership is, is that you just, every time I meet them, you know, you learn things about what's happening on the ground. So as I said, even this time I was talking to them, you know, learning about sort of their concerns about midday meal schemes and how they're working out on the ground was, it, it just kind of makes you think about things quite differently. Um, but it's not, and so that's just like someone I worked with and I continue to stay in touch with, but it's, it's a very different relationship to one of saying, here's my partner, you know, we sit in an office and we scale up projects together. I guess related to that, after when you're in the US and spending most of your time here, how do you kind of stay, stay aware of the issues that are most important or 
learn about what's happening um, on the ground in the places that you most of your research is focused on? I think that's hard. And I think the last two years, you know, it's been, I think, hard for all of us. And I, I think I very much feel for many of the people who are on the Zoom call, especially students, because I think this is the time when you would, many of you would have wanted to be in the field and getting that experience. Um, I mean, I think it becomes easier as you have contacts and as you have people you have calls with and, you know, you have collaborators on the ground you can talk to. Um, but I think that's I think that's something you co constantly juggle. I think also, you know, as I'm old now, so as you get older, you get kind of more caught up with university administration and things like that or your family. And then it's just harder to travel. And there is, I think, in the end, not really. Um, the same experience from trying to read online newspapers as it is from you know talking to people on the ground but as i said i think i've, I've been in a much luckier position than i think and i'd love to hear from people in the on the zoom call of you know what the last two years have been like in trying to start work in development and when the world shut down yes, absolutely um and yes, so if anyone does have questions that they'd like to ask, please feel free to put them in the chat and I will um, put them to Professor Pandey. Um, so I guess one issue that you have written uh, about and commented on is stagnating or declining female labor force participation for women in India. I was curious what you think needs to be done by the government or by other actors to increase the fraction of women in paid employment and whether there's anything in particular to address the impacts of COVID-19 that you think should be done? Those are big questions, and I think if I knew the answers to it, I would be very, very happy. I, uh, I can try to wager some guesses of things that I think are important, but um, I think this is even this is for me and I think for many others in the field, very much work in progress. So I think, you know, I think the fact uh, when you talk about the declining labor force participation in India is, you know, it's like, I guess it's a time series trend, but if you look, um, say, cross-sectionally across cohorts, I think the fact that really strikes up, strikes me about the Indian data relative to other countries is just really low rates of entry into the labor force. So, so I think typically when we think of female labor force uh, participation, we think of a case where women enter maybe even at the same rates as men till they're 24, 25, they drop out when they have kids, and then they may or may not come back. And that's sort of what people would typically call looks like the M shape of female labor force participation. What I think is incredibly striking about India is that India looks different. So women, so women enter at a much, much lower rate. So they'll enter, let's say, in, when they're 20, 21 at something like 20%, that will maybe increase a bit over time. It stabilizes when they're around 35 and then it slowly drops off. So there's both not this decline at the time of marriage or childbirth, but there's just low entry. And so that makes me think that whatever we want to do to affect female labor force participation, some of the largest returns, at least in terms of just absolute number of women, is, is um, kind of late adolescent and uh, women in the early 20s who have probably finished or left school at this point and are not yet married. So age of marriage has been rising. Um, schooling is, I mean, kind of education is rising, but there's a large fraction of people, women between the age of say 18 to 22, who are neither in educational institutions, nor are they married. Now that window might be closing with COVID. Um, you know, there's a lot of reports of earlier, earlier marriages. Um, so if that's happening, that would probably be um, kind of constraining the window, but I think whatever you can do in terms of skills training, in terms of making migration easier, I think that would really matter. The other thing, of course, is that um, if you look at, say, data from China, um, at the period of the kind of boom in Chinese growth in the census data, what was really striking was very high migration rates from inland China to coastal China by women between 15 to say 25 who were going to work in garment industries. And you know, very often they leave their kids behind with their grandparents or, um, but they, they were very mobile. I think in India, you know, a migration, internal migration for women is still very hard. They migrate at the time of marriage, but they don't migrate for jobs earlier. So anything you can do, I think, to make that process more secure could have high returns. Okay, thank you so much. That's really interesting. Um, 
So I guess on a personal level, the one, I guess one more question about research before we kind of transition to the section about advice. Um, on a personal level, what's a research project or research area more generally that you're currently most excited about and what areas do you think we kind of urgently need more research in? So what am I interested in right now? I think what I'm really interested in is, is trying to think about um, how what we see for say um, female labor force participation or gender dynamics more generally through what I would think of a more of as a political economy lens that accounts for power. So I think, you know, if you, I mean, I trained as a political econ as a political economist, I think it's not at all unusual in that to think for us to think about sort of strategic motivation or think about rent seeking or that, you know, if some group enters uh, a sector with high paid jobs, another group will suffer. And so they do things to keep them out. I think that that's like the bread and butter political economy. But and perhaps there is some hesitation for people to really think of that lens in thinking about um, you know gender relations or really thinking about how the what happens within the household and what happens in labor markets are, are very interlinked so you know I, I over the last summer i kind of for some time i sort of ended up doing some work looking at um, alfred marshall and his relationship with his wife and other women in cambridge and how he was incredibly against uh, fem women in economics and just reading that and just thinking about that time and time in Victorian England when there was structural transformation happening really made you feel that maybe some of what was just going on was they weren't they were a small set of very well paying say city jobs but um, you know you didn't want to give them up to women so I, I think the, I think thinking about how we can you know bring in those strategic considerations and think about that is something I'm kind of interested in that is there's a philosopher who I've enjoyed reading, Kate Mann, who I think who has argued that one should think about sort of uh, misogyny as really as a system that transfers power. And I think I think economists are very, um, I'd say very um, embarrassed to use these words sometimes. Somehow maybe people read too much of themselves into things when they talk about gender, which there's no obvious reason to. So it's like very much like, I'm not a terrible person. So then, you know, if you talk about misogyny or you talk about sexism in these terms of power, you're sort of saying that I'm a terrible person. And so somehow if you can persuade economists to not personalize gender economics so much, I think we may make more progress there. Oh well, yeah, that's very interesting. So could you say more about, I guess, terms that you think economists are a bit afraid of related to gender that you think we should be less afraid about talking about and kind of using explicitly? So I, said, I think something like thinking about, uh, you know, what, how we would as economists think of terms like say misogyny. Uh, I think that's a term that I think economists really don't like thinking about. I think we think about say things like discrimination. And I think we sort of talk about social taste or even systemic discrimination now. But this idea that you actually do it because uh, you just don't like seeing people in those spaces is I think is hard. I think I think the other thing to me that I've recently been thinking about, I don't actually know how to think about it very well. So I'd love to hear from others. I've been sort of thinking about when just because I've been reading a bunch of work on I think uh, gender issues is uh, I think if you read, say, you know, Judith Butler or if you read anyone writing about gender issues or trans issues right now. It, it, it's very interlinked. I said it's not just interlinking uh, marriage and labor markets, but it's also kind of interlinking how we think about sexuality or its role and how you 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 lead your life and possibly implications that has for you know labor markets and the choices you make. And I think if you're on any university campus right now, we know this is a huge part of what our undergraduates are thinking about. But somehow I think we don't even begin to have a language to think about whether that has any implications at all for say how labor markets shape up. Um, and I think, you know, we very easily say, well, we can't do much there because we don't have the data on it. We know even for LGBTQ, we have very bad data and surveys. But there seems to be a particular disjunction between how I'd say undergraduates in my university are thinking about a lot of these issues and kind of how we end up modeling them. Yes, I think that is a 
difference in what I've seen with the undergrads um, here at MIT as well. So I guess just for the last 10 minutes or so, I was going to transition to our last section, which is about advice for young women and men entering the economics, entering economics. So I guess the first question is just that you did your BA at St. Stephen's College in Delhi at Delhi University before going to Oxford for a master's degree and then LSE for a master's and a PhD. So I guess for those listening who also did their bachelor's degree in India and are interested in pursuing graduate school in the US, what preparation or in the US or in Europe, what preparation would you recommend before applying and what advice would you have about trying to figure out how, which graduate programs to apply to? So I think one thing I always say in general uh, is I'm very happy to try to give some information. I would stay very far away from giving advice because I think there are many ways of succeeding and advice has this connotation that there is one way to succeed. So I can certainly give some information that I think may be useful, but you know, you could do something completely different and be incredibly successful and get into places. So, you know, take this as one piece of information along with others. I think for answering that, I would really not draw on my experience because I think the, the process has just completely transformed since when I was there. It's a very, it's a, it's a lot more professionalized system. And I think it's, it's, um, it's one that looking at it now from the other side as, you know, recruiters or people reading PhD files, I would say it's a strikingly uh, unclear system whether anyone has got it right, how to do it, including those doing the screening. So I think, you know, I think, I think given there is so many problems in signaling, I think certainly, you know, things like, um, of course, you know, doing well in coursework, being able to think about why you're interested in doing it um, and where you want to do it, I think is super important. I think one thing people often forget is that faculty depths go deeper, you know, well outside the top 10. So I think, you know, I think it's important to take some time to look at a very broad range of schools to try to find at least some subset of schools, which maybe you can think of as schools will be easier to possibly be competitive in, but actually have um, exactly the, kind, the people you'd be really excited to uh, work with. So I think that would be, I think, one important uh, thing I would say. The other, of course, that, you know, and I think this I would particularly say, um, for those applying for India, even though it's a hard thing to uh, operationalize, I'm not quite sure how to operationalize it, is I think there's a lot of professionaliz professionalization uh, by, say, by how US letter writers write letters, um, right? So, I mean, I think that people recognize what it takes to write reasonably long letters with quite a lot of information. I think you very often find uh, letters from, from a bunch of other countries, not just India, a bunch of, uh, I think, countries outside the US UK system where you get these very short one paragraph letters which are very uninformative. So I think trying to figure some time to figure out that who, which of your faculty members are asking for letters actually have, you know, some experience or, you know, are willing to have a conversation about the fact that it's not writing a one paragraph letter. Um, the other thing that I think, I mean, we've been doing this also, I don't think students can do it very much, but I think it's relevant for women is that we know that there's quite a lot of gendered language used in these letters. And I think more so, I would say, um, in countries like India where they come. So, you know, all else equal, maybe you're better off as a woman getting a letter written by a woman than by a male professor. Uh, of course, usually all else is not equal. And I think the hard question is, what, what, if anything, can you do as a student to share information uh, with the faculty on what we've been learning about, uh, you know, differences in letters? I mean, so, for example, one thing I always do now is when I write letters, I pass them through one of these gendered readers, which tells you, you know, whether your letter is using words that are used too often for women, like, say, being hardworking and earnest, or whether it's using words that are used for men, like the person is a star or amazing. So I don't think this is something a student can do, but you know, to the extent you can, you know, have, I guess, seminars, or you can kind of, you know, hopefully researchers like reading other people's research, you know, kind of show evidence, you could tr start trying to change that. But certainly, I think the the weight of doing that falls much more on us as faculty than students. But I think at least being aware of that is probably valuable. 
Okay, thank you so much for that very helpful information. So I guess one related question from the audience as, audience asked as someone who has worked on advancing the status of women in economics academia, they're wondering what you what you think we've learned about how to how to how to improve problems about diversity in Indian economics departments. So perhaps related to caste or to gender. So, you know, I think, I mean, I guess the good news, the bad news is I don't think those problems are that much worse in, you know, Indian academia than say US schools. I think if you look at say African-American representation in say the PhD program where I am at at Yale or even among the faculty, it's, it, it's, it's I suspect it's n not better than what we see for you know, lower caste or like um, uh, other group, other disadvantaged groups in India. So I think I think the problems are very similar. So I guess that's the good news in that I think you could have um, a similar way of approaching it. I'm not sure how much success we made. I mean, the one thing I find that I try to do is is always think that you know, economists say that they're persuaded by quantitative data. So really trying to barrage say, the chair of my department or the chair of PhD admissions or others with just the papers that are coming out on several of these topics, you know, mm -hmm. so have to kind of get them to start thinking a little bit more about what could we be doing that's different there. Um, and, you know, sometimes the things that people don't even think about very much, which is, you know, um, a, 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 someone will come through for uh, job talk or you know for a job visit and they will it'll be a woman and she'll only meet men the entire day now it's tricky because i think the flip side of this which you know people often joke about is that you create this lady tax right so you know the the three uh, fa female faculty members or the three phd students or women are going to just be asked to do a lot more so i think it's also important if you're asking for this additional service to make sure that you're kind of compensating them by giving them less teaching or less other committees. So I certainly think there's a way of thinking about where do we think say role model effects or decision making is going to benefit the most from diversity. And if you're going to ask your underrepresented groups to take part in that at a higher rate, remove them from other places where you don't think it matters that much, um, not just add that on. But I, I think that's, that's probably the more important thing. And I think, um, Certainly from my own experience, I would say um, having um, just kind of senior women for me as mentors has been very important. Uh, I also think it's actually something you both have to not just seek out a bit, but notice a bit also, because I think, I mean, now when I look back and I really kick myself of there are times when I sort of now I think about it as like some senior woman when I was a junior faculty is coming to give a talk in a completely different area but actually would ask to meet me or would you know take the time to meet me and I would sort of not really think hard about what that meant or what I could have done that so I think I, I would say kind of proactively trying to uh, you know not just reach out but also noticing when people are available is useful we have I think um, it's easy to be, and I don't say this negatively at all, it's easy to be starry eyed about the stars in the profession, but the stars in the profession are very often, you know, all from the, the, the dominant majority group. And so I think it takes some effort to say, I will actually, maybe I will kind of go to their seminars and, you know, try to work with them, but I will also take the time to reach out to others who, you know, they may be someone who's super smart, but it's just like, has two young kids and it's just not around very much in the department, but you know, she actually may be someone it would be really valuable to make the effort to get to know when she can be around. Um, so a related question about being um, about the stage of your career, if you were an early career assistant professor. Um, so someone in the chat wanted to know if you had advice about how to mentor students well especially taking into consideration that it's quite time consuming. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I think one way as an assistant professor, I mean, mentoring, especially graduate students is working with them. I mean, I think that can be incredibly valuable all around them. I've had great experiences working even with undergraduates who have you know, continued to be my co-authors over time. So I think that's one way that you can mentor and at the same time, you know, 
be something that's fruitful for both of you. Um, I think the main thing I always say, which is in some ways hard often for people to implement, but you know that's unfortunately just how the world is right now is, I think what has huge returns in your young is a willingness to just be uh, mobile, to go for conferences, for seminars, to try to figure ways to be. And, and often, you know, you're like, people will be like, but I'm not getting invited to give seminars in departments. I think those are only one part of what you could be doing. I think they're long, increasingly a lot of these sort of both, you know, graduate student conferences or, you know, young faculty conferences like the NUDC or the PACDEV or others. And I think those are very valuable to go to. And I think, again, one thing that happens there is that I think you meet people who you could work with or talk to. And I think that that's, that's valuable. So I think, I think creating networks and, you know, figuring out how to be mobile are probably two of the highest return things you could do when you're young. Other than, of course, writing and submitting papers. Okay, and then one question that's sort of bringing together some questions from the chat for, I guess, people at a slightly earlier stage in their career. So I guess for people who have finished their bachelor's or their master's degrees and are considering doing a PhD in economics, what advice would you give about deciding whether or not to pursue a PhD in economics? And is it, would you recommend taking some time in between, um, some time in between if they're not certain, or would that kind of be a drawback on their application? I don't think it's a drawback on your application to take time if you're not certain. I think the worst thing is to kind of be in a program and you know either be unhappy there or not know why you're there. So I think I mean I think I think one thing that people often say and they kind of say particularly for uh, women is that you know you want maybe you want to also think about what age you finish your PhD at. But my own sense uh, as someone who has limited experience with this is there's never a right time for things to do like you know when to have a serious partner, when to have a child. And for many people, I think the best time is in graduate school or as an assistant professor. So I actually think my, as I said, based on very little personal experience, I think you want to really not try to let your career drive those decisions if they're important to you, because they'll never be the right time for that. And so once, if you're comfortable doing that, then I think this idea that I will only have kids when I have tenure and therefore I want to get tenure by the time I'm 33 or 34, I think hopefully becomes less important. And then I think what becomes important is actually just taking the time to figure whether or not you want to do a PhD and why you want to do it. I think, I mean, I'm sure I'm speaking to many of the people who uh, see this firsthand, you know, PhDs can be kind of depressing and long and, you know, lonely processes. So I think you, you want to enter it with some clarity on why you want to do it, uh, even if it takes a bit of time to get there. Absolutely, thank you. That sounds like very wise, um, very wise information. So I think the we're supposed to wrap up soon. So I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time today, Professor Pandey. I really enjoyed our conversation and appreciate you taking the time to speak with all of us. Thank you so much, Ayushi, and everyone on the Women Econ Policy Group for the invitation and for organizing these great events. Um, maybe I'll hand it over to Ayushi. Thanks, Lisa. That was really enjoyable. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Pandey and Lisa, for such an engaging and insightful conversation. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to engage with our community and answer all the questions that they've had this evening. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. It's a Thursday, but uh, that didn't deter our enthusiasm uh, Professor Pandey, we were very excited to speak to you. And Lisa, uh, thank you so much for moderating the session. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for being such a wonderful audience. We do such sessions quite regularly. So it'd be great if you guys can tune in from time to time and keep an eye out on our, on our social media pages. So I think we're OK to kind of end the session. But again, uh, heartfelt gratitude, Lisa and uh, Professor Pandey. Thank you so much for taking up the time to join us this evening. Yeah. Thanks very much. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thanks very much.